Let's start now. Recording in So once again, welcome to 12 Case Digest. 12 is the Ogolalo Family Foundation. It's a foundation made up of law students that discusses uh, precedents that are of immense uh, public interest for the general public. So we choose precedents that have raised certain issues in the public and we sit down, we analyze the issues of law around it, we bring in guests, and then we learn together. It's made up of students from various universities uh, uh, and various law schools in Kenya, but it's mostly stationed in the Patkari. Now, if you join us for the first time, I hope that particular introduction is sufficient. Now, further to the business of today, today we are discussing a case, petition number 40 of 2013. So I will just give you a brief description of what the case is about and certain issues or questions that we will be dealing with. And then I will introduce our panelists and from there we will begin. So around, yeah. so around 2011, there was a paper that was done by the Kenya National Human Rights Commission. It was called The Outload Amongst Us. So this particular report showed a lot of sufferings or issues that the LGBTI community, those are the lesbians, gays, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and queer group community, who are passed by officials subjected to physical violence. Thank you. Can you enjoy? That report showed two percent gay people, lesbian people, and people who belong to that particular group were disowned by their families. So in 2013, Eric Gitari, a lawyer by profession and a person who identifies with came up with a proposed NGO for gay people. NGO was supposed to be registered by the NGO coordination board. So Mr. Guitari took the following names, the Gay Lesbians and Human Rights Council, Gay Lesbians and Human Rights Observancy, Gay uh, Lesbians and Human Rights Organization, Gay Lesbians and Human Rights Commission, and Gay Lesbians and Human Rights Collective for a, a reserve at the NGO board to be registered as an NGO. And all these names that were taken by Mr. Eric Guitari were rejected by the NGO board. Uh, citing the sufficient grounds for the board were, were then that the names were, to, uh, were aimed at registering an NGO that was going to promote an illegality or criminality within the state of Kenya. So this issue brought issues. There was a lot of issues there in and Mr. Gary now went to court and his question before the court was whether a person who is gay or lesbian or a person who identified with the LGBTI community qualified as a person under Article 36 of the Constitution, and if so, whether their right to association was infringed by that particular NGO not being registered by the NGO Coordination Board. So the NGO Coordination Board relied on Regulation 8 of the NGO Regulation. So tonight, we have a bench made up of different people. We have Ayo Asembo, we have Ian Yenko, we have Rosemary Wanjiru, we have Innocent Wanyoni, from Jekwatkari. We also have Kiru Mburu stepping in. We have, uh, uh, we have Michelle Santos. Michelle Santos is joining us as a panelist from Moi University. In our guest list, or, uh, where we are going to have a lot of engagement or experience conversations, we have Quinta Utieno from Centum and Grace Maina Glynis will be joining us at around 8.10 also for this discussion. So tonight we have certain issues. We're not going to actually review the case, but there are certain issues that came from the case that we're going to talk about. And so with that, I think, let me just confirm whether my panelists are in so that we can begin this conversation. Kirumburu, are you in, sir? Um, yes, Max, I am yeah, I am here with you guys. How are you? Uh, thank you, bro. I'm fine. How Are you a sim? Le Mayani Enko?
Oh, hello bro. Um Yeah, okay, bro. Thank you. Uh everything you Michel Santos. Good evening. I'm in. Okay, thank you. Rosemary Wanjiru. Okay. Quinta. Yeah. I hope I'm audible. Am I in? Yeah, I can. Yes, I'm in. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I think it's Rosemary and Ayo was not confirmed yet, and Innocent will be joining us around the same time. So I think it's it's good to begin. So this is the format. We will be posting a question at the chat box, and that's the question that the panelists will address first. And once the panelists have given their thoughts on that particular question, audience session can raise their hand. There's an option of raising hand. So you can raise your hand if you want to contribute to the very question so that when the panelists are done, you can pick up. So for the panelists, uh, it's preferable at least we have your video on for recording purposes. A place where you can turn on your video will be way better. And even for you guys, uh, once the question is posted at the chat box, one panelist is already going, you can also raise your hand uh, at the raise hand option so that we channel you so that it becomes a flowing conversation. So the question uh, would rather be, I was, I was reading the case and while reading the case, uh, what the state actually relied on or the defense of the attorney general was that promotion and protection of morals is a function of the state. And therefore where the state feels that uh, whatever is being against the morals, then a state can come in to stop that particular conduct. So if you also re realize that what the your coordination board relied upon was regulation eight of the, uh, of the NGO regulations. And that regulation eight leaves room for the director of the NGO coordination board to at will decide what is desirable and what is not desirable for registration. So my first question actually to the panelists, and it's the question that we are going to post at the chat box. To what extent does morality influence law? And should mor morality be used as a ground for limiting human rights? I'd start that conversation with my friend Kiru Muru. Kiru, to what extent does morality influence the law? And if it does, should morality be used as a ground for limitation of human rights? Uh, referring to Eric Bittari case and further elaborating. Okay, thank you very much. Now, apologies, I won't be able to turn on my video. Uh, I, I have, uh, okay, there's a lot that's going on in the house, so uh, I can't find a really good place. Now, um, anyway, uh, morality and the law has always been uh, the biggest bane of the conversation. You know, uh, to be very, very brief about it, I think we all uh, have to go to the most basic aspects of what is morality and what is the law to even uh, begin on the influences that one have over the other. Now, the beauty with law is that law is objective since it cuts across. Uh, morality is subjective on the other hand. Uh, now, when morality is subjective, this means that your morality cannot be my morality, but we have something that really cuts across us all, which is the law. Now, of course, the influences of morality cannot uh, not be seen in the law. Uh, they have to be seen. Uh, everyone knows of DPP versus Shaw. Uh, uh, the, the, I think it's, a, it's an old English case uh, where uh, the law, uh, the courts held that uh, these guys who are trying to uh, display, uh, it was a case about uh, uh, 
uh, prostitutes trying to solicit men from the streets. And then they, they were told that you cannot solicit men on the streets. Then they went to solicit them from the balconies because they were not the streets. But regardless, they were still jailed because uh, there was the moral influence of, uh, you know, soliciting men from the streets. Now, uh, morality is very, very subjective. Now, in uh, with regard to the Eric Guitari case, uh, then uh, Eric Guitari's morality is not the same as Max Ogula's morality. It's not the same as Quinta's morality. It's not the same as Kiro's morality. Therefore, if you're going to try to create a uh, morality to be a guiding principle in defining or you know in trying to establish. Uh, some of these aspects of the law, such as human rights, which are very, very basic to everyone, then you're going to uh, really, really violate so many human rights because uh, morality does not morality does not cut across as well as uh, as as well as the way the law does. Therefore, when you have a, when you have a bill of rights, uh, then we should be bound more or less by the law of our being bound by being bound by uh, the morals. Uh, I, I I know there are going to be so many questions, and this panel is is so broad based. So I don't I don't want to spend any more time on on that statement. And in, uh, before I you know hand over to the next panelist or to the moderator, I I, I think it would be nice to say hi to Quinta again. Uh, Quinta, Quinta judged me uh, in some moot in Mombasa and it's very, very fascinating to see uh, me being in the same panel as someone who judged me. And then uh, the most interesting thing is that I also judged Michelle Santos. Uh, so it's really, really, really nice, you know, like to see that all of us can get to a platform where we can come share ideas and discuss it all. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Kiru. Uh, that was uh, my friend Kiru Mburu. And yeah, Quinta, Quinta judged both of us in that very mood of Kiru. <laughs> it's an honor hosting Quinta. <laughs> so from, from Kiru Mburu, we have, uh, okay, what, or what, what the point is advancing is that morality is uh, subjective, while the law, on the other hand, is objective. However, he has, he has not told us whether morality can be used to limit human rights or whether it's a ground. Because there's a general conversation about what forms morality actually is the decisions of the society, and it is the society that makes the law. And by large or by, by a larger extent, morality ends up influencing the law. However, if you come to the legal terms, we know very well that Article 24 sets out the very clear um, steps of limitation of human rights and human rights can only be limited by law and you see there's now nowhere where morality comes in so th that's a conversation that i would want uh, the panelists at least to maybe advance so that we learn from that point but i don't see either of them raising hand so maybe i will invite uh, quinta because she's a guest on the same then we skip that to the next question because they don't raise their hands you can also raise your hands as an audience if you have an answer to that question and the panelists are not talking about it Queen, come in. Thank you, Max. Um, so I'd say uh, something very interesting is that morality does influence the law. And uh, before I delve in into this, hi, Kiru. A pleasure seeing you here as well. Max, pleasure seeing you here. And thank you for having yeah. me on the panel. Uh, so yes, morality by and large does influence the law. On the basis that, um, while morality might not be uniform, what a significant portion of the society believe as being moral can influence what they adopt as law. Yeah, to this extent, I'd perhaps take us to, given that we are talking about sexual minorities and the LGBTI community, um, I think I'd take us to Article 45, sub Article 2. I think someone has unmuted. Yes, I take us to Article 45, sub Article 2 of the Constitution that specifically mentions that um, marriage shall be between a man, uh, a person, and the other of the opposite sex. So that caveat already shows you the standpoint that the law has taken as a result of the influence of the morality in the society. So while morality might be subjective, 
morality does influence the law to the extent that if a large group of people in a society believe a certain thing to be true, then they are very much likely to pass and uphold our thing as a legal, you know, to, to give it the force of law. So to that extent, you see a clause like Article 45, sub Article 2, seeing the light of day. Why? Because arguably, and again, just to go back to the decision of um, Justice Odunga, Justice Mativo in the EG petition, arguably the people of Kenya through Article 45, sub Article 2, deemed it, uh, you know, that a majority of the people of Kenya thought mm -hmm. that certain acts should be unacceptable in the society. So to that extent, morality does influence the law. Now, can morality limit a human right? I'd say no, it can't. While morality might influence the law, it's only the law that can limit another right. So for morality to, in one way or another, limit a particular right, then it has to have gotten to that point where a majority of the society believe it to be true and therefore accord it a force of law. So to that extent, morality does not directly limit my rights. And if you go back to the case of Ox versus Republic, the standard for limitation, yeah? First of all, it can, a right can only be limited by a law and it must pursue a legitimate aim. And it must be justifiable in an open and democratic society. And it must not limit rights to the extent of derogating the said rights, which is basically what Article 24 reiterates. But it all goes back to one principle. Your morals cannot limit a right. And I think that is what the Eric Gitari decision uh, that we're discussing today uh, brings out. That is what it uh, enumerates. It simply says, the court will simply say, telling the NGO board, you cannot decide based on your moral perspectives to limit another person's freedom of association. So morality cannot by itself and directly limit human rights. Not unless uh, a wide number of people, a large number of people in the society believe it to be true and therefore call it a force of law, it cannot otherwise directly limit a human right that is in itself inherent in a person. That would be my take on this. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Quinta. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, that was that was insightful, um, very insightful. Yeah, the chronological change of things that creates the moral <laughs> law that reality influences what becomes law. But now, on the point of law and limitation of human rights, uh, a human right will only be limited with what has taken the force of law. So it's a chronological sequence, morality to law and now law to limitation of rights. Very interesting. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to hear what Lemayan Yanko thinks of the same before we move to the second question. Ian, take the floor. Oh, hello, Max. Uh, Points from Quinta. Hello, Quinta. Ian, your connection has issues. I think we'll bring you in another time because we cannot hear you clearly. My name is Lemayan, and I'm a student of what First, I'd like to address on the first question about morality and to what extent does morality actually does influence the law. Uh, it is missing understood that what Pardon me, but we can't catch Lemayan very well, so I don't know whether you can hear us. Lemayan. 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 Okay, Lemayan's connection. Hello, bro. Has... Yes, bro, can you hear us? Yes, I see Kosawa. Yes, I could better. Please proceed, Sasa. Apologies, apologies, man. So as I was saying, I am just going to pick up the conversation that Lemayan left it. And it is on morality and how it influences the law before I go into the next three issues that uh, we addressed in the poster. So first, the, in, the, the link, bit, I don't want to repeat myself uh, as Quinta and uh, Robin have addressed the question of morality and the law, but what I would like to insist more is the last point that you left, that morality, the, the morality of the society cannot in fact limit fundamental rights and freedoms, which have been guaranteed by, by the by the Ian, we will when you go back to the Eric Gitari case, 
Uh, okay. I would like to quote Mother Comey's dissenting opinion, and it was it was this. So the morality of a society, no matter how strong, cannot influence and cannot, in fact, limit fundamental rights that have been guaranteed by the Constitution. So. Uh, okay, Ian, Ian, I think we will stop you there for now and you'll come in later. And Joy, you can mute Ian for now because his connection is not so clear. So I think he can be muted directly from your end. Uh, Michelle Santos is also a panelist. And she has I think the last two take. Ian. The laws that we make. They are to a certain. Okay, Michelle Santos, you can you can unmute and proceed. Uh, we will bring Ian another time. Okay, thank you very much, Obola. First and foremost. Okay, first and foremost, I would like to point out clearly that morality does affect the law. And it does not just affect the law in a small way, it does affect the law in a big way. Because when the drafters are bringing up this law, they put their morality into that, into, into, the, into, the, into the law that we are now talking about. I call this the political morality. It is the morality of the drafters of the constitution and the laws of Kenya. According to some uh, South African case, National Coalition for Gay and Lesbian Equality versus Ministry of Justice, they said that morality is found in the text of the and spirit of the constitution. Therefore, when the courts are interpreting the constitution and they would like to bring in morality, they have to look at the text and the spirit of the constitution. They have no license whatsoever. They have no mandate whatsoever to put their morality into interpretation of the constitution. It is only seen in the spirit of the constitution. And with regard to the Eric Guitari case, the spirit of the constitution is that it is only male and female who are allowed to cohabit. It is only male and female who are allowed to come in together into any sexual relationship. Therefore, the spirit and the text of the constitution points us to the drafters of the constitution who in their minds, um, in their political morality, sought to show that um, in an African context, it is only male and female. And that is what we will go by because morality shall follow the law shall follow the spirit and text of the constitution. Thank you. I uh, thank you. That's 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 a brief good one from from Miss Santos over there. But uh, I wanted to categorically state even before we go on that of, of our of contention today is not marriage or criminality. We are talking about gays, lesbians, uh, uh, bisexuals, transgender, and the intersex. And as we advance this conversation, you will see that our concern is whether or not these people, by the nature of their own sexual orientation or their identity as a people, fall outside the protection of the law. So it, it is uh, my plea to the audience, as well as the panelists sitting in, that we shy away from the idea of uh, sexuality, um, I mean, no, not sexual, the idea of marriage, criminality, or so, or the ideas of section 162, 163, 165. We can discuss it at length, but our issue today is does your orientation or does your individual identification put you or should it or not put you outside the protection of law? So another thing that actually comes very critically from when, when you read that judgment is the aspect of putting the LGB together with the TI. There are two groups. You have the lesbians, the gays, and the bisexuals. And then we have the transgender and the intersex. So the question rather is, should these two groups be identified together? If yes, why? If no, what is the difference and what makes them not uh, be able to be identified together? So I'll... Okay, okay, Queen, Queen, I've seen you cannot find the trouble of raising your hand. So I'll start with Kiru again on this one. 
explore on this one, the difference between the group of LGB and the group of the TI. And maybe I'll, I'll bring in Quinta after, after a while. Or Quinta, you can, go, you can go ahead. I've seen the message. Yes, point out something. Um, so um, uh, not, to, not to go against the objective of the discussion today, but um, just to point out that those specific provisions uh, answer the question as to whether your sexual orientation should have you either impact, you know, the extent to which a sexual orientation determines whether or not you're within the protection of the law. Yeah, so the provisions of section 165, 162 of the penal code, the provisions of article 45 sub article two, very, very strongly determine whether or not uh, LGBTQI really find themselves within the protection of the law. As much as we will try to distinguish between sexual orientation and the actual engagement in those same-sex sexual acts, those specific provisions of the law to a great extent and, and I'm aware the court in the Eric Gitari case did not really delve into that aspect of things because it was not in contention. But I think uh, those specific provisions, we cannot avoid talking about them because they answer the question as to, in Kenya today, if I am a lesbian, to what extent does the law, does the law protect me? Does the law limit its protection of me to a certain extent simply because my sexual orientation is in a manner that the law does not you know, find to be natural? So I think it's very important we address that as well. Sorry for hijacking that this, this session here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, actually, so that's that's uh, that's good. Uh, my my point was not actually not addressing the sections as they are on 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 this point, but I am trying to take us away from the conversation of uh, dealing with gays at the marriage level. Okay or uh, dealing with gays, uh, lesbians, and bisexual, or even people like intersex and the transgender. Because as, as we go further in this discussion, you'll realize that someone can be homosexual and then they don't engage in sexual activities for the rest of their lives. So uh, my, my primary concern, or what I, I'd like us actually to have a conversation on, is the first address of these people from the individual, from the individual basis, from the point of being gay, being lesbians, being bisexual, being transgender, intersex, or queer. Yes, we might use section 162, 163, 165 in our explanation on illegality or not, but just the way the court did not delve in them, I, I don't want our conversation to shift from what we're talking about to those specific sections of the penal code. However, as we said earlier, it's a free space for discussion and whichever way or whichever point you feel is bulky in advancing your point of view is highly welcome. So the, the question I was asking is uh, whether there is need to separate the two groups. If there is need, why? And if there's no need to separate the two groups, what is the reasoning? Because if you read the case very well, then you will come to understanding that there was a contention of putting the LGB together with the TI. So Kiru Mburu was going. We'll, yeah, we'll follow that order, Kiru. Okay, um, thank you once again. Uh, so now, um, okay, before I, before I address uh, the immediate question, I think it's also a bit important to mention just, just slightly a bit on uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, okay, their status under the law. Of course, uh, Quint has posed a question uh, whether if she's, she would have been or she is a lesbian, whether she has a different protection of the law. Of course, I think not. Uh, the constitution is very clear against discrimination, uh, uh, mentioning uh, uh, in inclusivity, uh, human dignity, and all these aspects. And uh, uh, it you know uh, it does not state that uh, people should be discriminated against on any basis whatsoever and any any of the other uh, considerations that people give. Uh, now then on to the LGBTQI and the uh, the differences. Now of course uh, the whether they should be kept together or different. So. Uh, LGBTQI, I think now L is for lesbians, gays, bisexual, intersex, and trans transgender people. Uh, the reason why this question is arising is because uh, the lesbians, the gays, and the bisexuals are people who are affected by their sexual orientation. Uh, they are completely, they have no biological defects. Uh, in a say, uh, you know, defects may sound a bit of a rude one, but let me just use it. 
uh, they have no biological defects, but the transgender and the intersex persons have more or less biological defects that render them to have uh, questions about not just their sexuality, but also their sex. So uh, for the transgender, uh, someone, I think someone is muted their mic. Um, kindly, okay, thank you. So um, now, as I was saying, like lesbians, gays, and bisexuals have no issues with, uh, have no biological defects. I'm putting that in quotation marks in case I, I might offend someone. Uh, but then now the transgender and the intersex persons have more or less biological defects in questioning their sexual orientation and also their sex. Now, uh, uh, categorizing them together, uh, for them, I think, uh, with, with the with the human rights commissions that are in existence, for example, there's the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission. Uh, that one is for uh, for gays and lesbians. There's intersex commissions. There's transgender commissions, especially because they are all civil service organizations that try to address their specific their specific human rights. But I think the the biggest the the idea with trying to group them together is the unity in numbers and unity of purpose. As this all these groups are minorities, which have one issue that cuts across sexual orientation. Uh, but now. There's a distinction. Bosibori. Sarah Williams. Bosi. Okay, thank you. So now, like the the issue that cuts across is sexual orientation, which the equality in numbers, which is important for them to try to fight for their rights, because usually realize in a society that like ours, which is homophobic and transphobic especially because of our, you know, we, we have claimed to be a very religious country, which I do not think we are. But now, uh, because of the transphobia and the homophobia that arises, I think they try to group group them together. I don't think they should, uh, because uh, I think for the gays, lesbians, and uh, for the gays, lesbians, and bisexual people, uh, smog, Kindly, kindly meet. Uh, for the gays, lesbians, and bisexual people, I think they they can uh, in this time and age, they they easily survive. You know, they they can go along with it. But the transgender and the intersex people, they have issues with you know registration of their identity. Like their issues are very different sometimes. The only point where they come to to bring a distinction maybe is on the creation of the family unit or in the marriage unit or you know in the trying to create such relationships. But then you get to realize that uh, the violence and the oppression, it's, it cuts across because people don't even understand these whole groups. Now, the moment you try to group them together, you create a bulk minority system, you know, like a separationist system of sorts. It's, it's like how we've grouped in our minds, okay, some of us, most of us have grouped uh, all Arabs to be terrorists. Yet there are Arabs who are like Indian Arabs, you know, they're Arabs from who, like they are completely different groups. But once your mind groups them, you already have a particular perception about them, which is very wrong and stereotypical. So I think when they group them together, they create uh, they create a bigger disadvantage by increasing the possibility and probability of violence against them, in as much as they are trying to fight for their joint rights under the umbrella of sexual orientation, I think that they shouldn't be together. Uh, but uh, them being together, maybe it serves a, a great purpose, you know, petition, uh, repeal 162, uh, all the other guitar cases, the appeals, uh, even to this petition for 40 of 2013, uh, they try to, they try to, when you group them together, they try to address issues together, but, they bring, I think it's a, a catch-22 situation that it's trying to achieve something, but at the same time, it also has more disadvantages depending on how they feel as a minority. But regardless, uh, pro-human rights, uh, not pro uh, the agenda that they are trying to push. 
Well, okay, okay. Thank you, Kiru, for for that for that elaborate one. Before before Asimbu comes in, there's there's a point that we have picked from Kiru, and I like doing this after every panelist so that we learn. Kiru states that um, there's a difference. The LGB community, there are community that deals with sexual orientation, so issue of attraction. They do not have any biological defect. And then there's the group, the TI, that is identifiable by the biological defect, which we will come into in our next question when we'll be dealing with these people who is a transgender, who is an intersex. And so there is a reason, or there is rather a desire, according to what Kiru states, to put these two groups at different at par so that the LGB that are fighting for their attraction or for the recognition of their attraction, so to put it, is differentiated from the trans and the intersex that have biological defects. So then, um, that, that is interesting. Let's hear what Ayo Asimbo has on the same. Ayo, you can pick up. Uh, thank you so much, Max Ogola. Fortunately or unfortunately, it seems we are having our evening prayers currently. I don't know whether it's interfering with my uh, my presentation. Unless uh, I'll, I'll proceed unless there's any concern uh, as to my audibility. So uh, the, uh, about about the question which, which you've just posed about whether there's a, a distinct difference between Mortality. Uh, uh, there has been much between law and mortality. Uh, if you may take instances of various precedents between law and mortality. Asimbo, I don't know whether it's just me or we are losing you, and that is very bad for this track of conversation. So could you check your network, your connection? Okay, as, as a symbol, as a symbol uh, does that, Moses Ogutu has posted a question on the chat box. And because you have not bring an audience in so far, let's bring in Moses Ogutu. Could you, bro, elaborate or pose your question vocally? <laughs> Welcome, bro. Uh, uh, thank you, Max, and good evening, everyone. Uh, mine was just a question in trying to understand uh, the topic that you're dealing with. So I was trying to bring it in a, from a point of understanding to a point where maybe the waters are murky, because it's stated that uh, democracy, from a point of democracy, we tend to say that it's the rule of the people, by the people, and for the people. What about the law? Is the law for the people? And when you say the people, do we mean everyone, or do we mean a certain majority of people? and we leave out the minority so that whatever the majority say that goes and whatever and whatever the minority tried to fight for it's only hard but it's not implemented case in point what we have right now when you look at the rights of people uh, who are lgbti and as per contradiction of what kiro was trying to say we have the lgb and then we have ti LGB for sexual orientation, TI for gender identity. How is the law roping them in in such a way that they do not feel excluded? And that's what Quinta was trying to pose it at Article 45.2. You get that persons of LGB and even to an extent persons of TI, do they feel uh, that liberty? or freedom to exist within, in a country whereby they feel unsafe, they feel unsecure. That's the context in which I was trying to bring the question. Hopefully I may get answers. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, my friend Moses. Thank you. Actually, our next question for the panelist is, should your sexual orientation put you outside the protection of law? And I think when we'll be addressing that question, we will cap in the entire question of when then do we put in the difference. But I want to put this in a, in a chronological manner so that we understand as we go step by step. 
first there are these two groups and I'm, I'm really targeting my panelists and you guys in the audience section to put a clear difference. What differentiates the LGB from the TI? And if there's a distinction, the way Kiru was trying to put it, of the LGB and the, from the TI, is there a need to protect them differently or is there a need to still have them in that cocoon? Because we had this conversation about three days or four days ago with a, a lecturer with our mentor and also there was a friend of mine, Tony Mutuma, in that forum. And Tony brought the uh, smart idea that the reason why these people are encompassed together is that even the transgender or the intersex, when it comes to the issue of their sexual orientation, they still find themselves within the same community. They, their attraction is within the same community. And Madam was of another brilliant idea that someone can be homosexual and their entire life they don't have sex. So tonight, I think it would be a very good point of conversation if we can draw a distinction of the LGB from the TI clearly, and then answer the question of whether or not they should be put together, one or two persons from this forum will have learned. So let me bring in Santos Michel, uh, and was raised, and then we can bring in our, our guest again, Quinta, to give a, a further clarification. Santos. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again, Ogola. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to agree with uh, Kiru. He was my judge. Awesome judge. Um, I would like to agree with Kiru that LGB is on sexual orientation, while T on gender identity, it is always a matter of the traditional culture of the society. That a culture uh, or Traditionally, there are behavioral differences between a man and a woman, and this brings some confusion in the T and the I. They do not know where they stand. Well, the LGB, the, theirs is mostly an emotional or sexual attraction that they have decided. Actually, um, no offense, no offense. I hope I am offending no one. The LGB have a chance, they have a choice to leave their ways, but the TI, they stay with it. They are born male, but they feel female. And um, on to, sorry, uh, Max, I think I have forgotten your second question. What was your second question? I do have a <laughs> It's funny you say the board where they feel female, but, <laughs> but we are we're coming to that question in a few. That, that's actually not the case, but it's an interesting summary. My question is, okay, so if they do not uh, actually champion for the same thing, then is there a need to put them in different groups? What's the need? Or is it okay they're still under one community? Uh, frankly, I believe them being in one community is very detrimental because uh, while I was doing family law, this is what the law says, that man and woman biologically, the TI have been biologically given, or is it have, they have been biologically born with a confusion in mind. So putting them together with the LGB who have uh, no offense again, chosen to pick that road is wrong and it would in some way infringe on their rights. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Santos, and hold the thought there because we are coming to you whether the sexual orientation is a matter of choice or whether it's something someone cannot control. We'll come back to that conversation. Meanwhile, let's hear from Ms. Uh, Rosemary Wanjiru before I bring in our guest. Rosemary. Are you in the house? Okay, if we don't have Rosemary Wanjiru, then Lemayan Yenko. Yes, bro, I'm back. I hope I'm okay. clear. Yeah, did you find, did you get the question? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you the question. Okay. Proceed. But first, uh, allow me to approach uh, the question there. The, the conversation from where it has been left of whether sexual orientation and in fact the LGBT rather a matter of choice or a matter that is in it. Well, according to me, I believe that members of the LGBTQ uh, statistics show and when you hear a lot of them speak, it is not something that they choose by choice. It's not a matter of choice, but rather it is something that someone is born. Well, the rest of us at the age of 14 we started getting attracted to ladies 
you find that uh, a gay person perhaps says that it never came in fact he was born man he was born with all the the equipment of a man but somewhere in between he lost it and started being attracted to other men and this is something that you cannot <clears throat> you cannot remove out of yourself and when you read the famous botswana case i think it is motse demang versus uh, the state of botswana abbas versus the attorney general uh the the, the 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 person was a university student he was 24 years old and he was saying that he tried as much as possible to be attracted to the opposite gender so when it comes to matters of sexual orientation i don't believe it is a question of choice and i i think it is more of an something that develops inside you it is innate i am i'm not saying it is something that is with the genes and something like that but rather it is something that is born with the personality of an individual uh on to the second uh, spectrum of the conversation is whether sexual orientation people who the sexual have protection of the law uh, i would like to guide the audience and the panelists to article 27 and when you check article 27 and the constitution of south africa i think it is section 12 it includes among among the grounds for non discrimination it includes sexual orientation among them But when you check at the Kenyan Constitution at 27 it says that no one shall be discriminated on this grounds including but it is not the spectrum is not limited but when you check when you read our our our, our legis, when you read the constitution well it does not limit it does not limit the it does not limit the spectrum of article 27 whereas the South African constitution expressly states that sexual orientation is a ground for non discrimination I think this is a this is this is a, the position that the Kenyan authorities have been taking that when you come to the Kenyan constitution and you go to article 27 it is not expressly categorizing sexual orientation as one of the grounds and when you take the moral teachings the moral uh, the, the 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 shapings of the Kenyan law taking into consideration section 162 165 of the penal code which criminalizes the act of homosexuality it clearly shows that the kenyan people were in fact not ready to protect this uh, uh the people who expressly come out and 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 express their sexual orientation whereas it may be said that we do not discriminate them look at the look at the facts out here look at the treatment that the police offers these people when they expressly come out and express themselves look at the society's reaction so whereas the kenyan constitution is saying and the kenyan uh, Uh, people are saying that it, it it is protecting these people the the matters on the ground it speaks for itself these people are not protected uh, and i would like also like to address on the question of whether the lgb and the, the lgbt the lgb and the tq whether they should be categorized together when you look at the transgender people and the bisexual they are expressing it is more on the gender roles the the first question on the panel was whether gender and sex are the same thing no no, sex, no bro, we will we will come to the questions of the panel just address the specific question in the chat box so that we have time to address all the questions systematically okay which 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 question am i let me check the question which question am i to address easy okay let me let me bring in let me bring you in the next because you have spent some some time and we have learned from you but the question we are dealing with the right now is whether the lgb and the ti ought to be treated separately and the reason why so let me let me bring you in after a few but for for now because of the interest of time let's hear from uh, quinta on the same issue so that when glynis comes in we start on the rest part of the issues quinta what are your thoughts there's a lady in the chat box saying that the lgb and the ti both belong to the um to the marginalized group by dint of article 260 these are these are a funny argument because it's an argument that has been raised so many times and the question whether or not the lgbtiq are marginalized persons but while you are addressing that the question on the table is that should the lgb and the ti be within the same group as they are or is there a ground that their needs are different and they ought to be protected differently and if so then what's the criteria quinta thank you for the question um so according to me uh that two things we must distinguish here and i feel like so many issues am i audible we miss you we miss your video though 
<laughs> it's, it's right, it's right there. So there are so many issues that have been raised uh, by the people who've spoken before me. I don't think I can remember all of them. So I'll just stick to what you've asked. Um, you know, is there a distinction between the intersex and transgender persons and the lesbians, gays, and bisexual persons? Number one, I'd like to correct uh, and gently so. Uh, the other panelists who've spoken before me, it's not a biological defect. Because when you put it as a defect, uh, there's a negative intonation to it. So it's not a biological defect. Just because someone has been born differently or with different features or with a different inclination does not necessarily mean that, you know, that is not who they're supposed to be. Or they are, that it's against the norm. So it's not a defect. Um, yeah, and it's, 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 um, I think it's important we desist from qualifying any or calling any persons as, you know, they are, that they have a defect, it's not a defect. Uh, so to go into the distinction, so for me, lesbians, gays, and bisexuals, that's basically sexual orientation. It's basically who am I attracted to and who can I express myself with in the sexual context. So for a lesbian, they're attracted sexually to another. It's one female and another, another female. For someone who's gay, um, it can be a man to man or woman to woman because the, again the term is very it can be used for both. So for me, um, lesbians, gays, and bisexuals that speaks to sexual orientation. That is the mode of attraction. For transgenders, um, speaks to their identity. And again, to go back to what one of the panelists mentioned uh, in terms of gender. So whereas uh, sex in the strict sense of it speaks to the biological organs that you were born with, transgenders struggle with a question of um, identity in terms of their gender. So fine, I was born with a penis, but I do not feel like a man. I do not, um, I do not align myself to with what society expects a man to be. In fact, I feel like a woman. So uh, trans transgenders for me are people who just struggle with the whole concept of, you know, their sexual identity and gender identity. So it's not necessarily biological in terms of physical features. Uh, it's rather the inclination they have towards, uh, you know, a different gender stroke sex, uh, depending on how you choose to interpret it. Uh, for the intersex persons on the other hand, these are people who are born with um, more than one, Let's just say that Janet, with how they are born, you can't no. strictly say it's a male or female. Yeah. So for me, um, you can't really lump them together. You have to. Okay, there's someone who's not. Uh... Yes. So for me, you can't lump them together because there are peculiar things they face. So on the one hand, uh, there's a category of people who struggle with the fact that. Um, the laws do not really give them the freedom to express their sexual orientation and to freely express our intimacy and you know whatever they feel towards the people they're attracted to. And then we have this other category of people who don't identify with you know, the biological features they were born with. And then we have this other group of people who can't really be placed in one box. So it's very distinct. And it's important that the issues are not lumped up. So when you put together, um, you know, an intersex person in the same category as uh, lesbians, gays, and bisexuals, you're basically trying to, you're literally avoiding talking about the real issue affecting that intersex person. Because for an intersex person, um, they're not struggling with the question of, uh, they might, and yeah, they might be struggling with that, but their main point of concern is that the society hasn't, uh, brought itself to a point where it acknowledges that there are people who do not fit within one box. They can't be either male or female. And therefore, how do we accommodate them as a society? For transgenders, uh, these are people who are arguing, look, you're saying I'm male, but I do not identify with that. And again, now that brings out the whole conversation of gender. So I have a penis, but I don't identify as male. For LGBTQ, for, for the LGB category of people, it's basically the law trying to deny them uh, the freedom of expressing that 
you know, the sexual attraction they feel towards uh, persons of, you know, they, they're same sex persons, basically the same sex relations. So you can't lump them up together. But then again, uh, you can't, uh, and that's just to agree with the other panelists, you can't lump them up together. But at the same time, you can't um, identify the last, the, the, the latter, that is the TI, as persons with certain biological defects. That's not proper. And so to go back to the Eric Gitari case, uh, the conversation the court was having uh, on, you know, the petitions that were brought up indicating that transgenders and intersex people are not part of the LGBTI group. Fair enough, it's true they're not part of it, but uh, the reasoning of the court was to the effect that as much as um, the TI bit of this, um, you know, acronym doesn't really relate to sexual orientation, just because a society has that as part of its name does not mean that they cannot advance a particular course. Yeah, so that is the crux of the argument the court was giving um, when this objection was brought that just because they have adopted that acronym LGBTI does not mean that they cannot advance the interests of a sexual minority. There is no prohibition in law that says, for instance, I can start an organization that deals with, you know, I can just say human rights. And then all along my focus is on, say, the rights of sexual minorities. So just because I've made a blanket um, declaration or, you know, I've given that organization some blanket description does not bar me from advancing a specific cause. And that was the crux of the court's argument. But uh, be that as, as it may, um, and as we've said uh, previously, and I think all of us are aligned to that fact, um, LGBTI can't be lumped up together as one group because they face peculiar issues. That would be my point to that. And I think there's a question in democracy. I don't know if you'd like uh, for me to touch on that at this point of the conversation. But again, I think uh, we've gone over this argument that the law is a reflection of what the majority think more often than not, which is why during the promulgation of the 2010 constitution, there are those who voted no, there are those who voted yes. And simply because the percentage of those who voted yes were more than those who voted no, it became the supreme law of the land. So at the end of the day, Yes, we might argue that the law aims to protect um, minorities, which in an ideal world it does, but ultimately the law constitutes what the majority have decided it should constitute, which it brings me uh, to this um, theory in jurisprudence. Um, I, I, can, I think it was Dworkin who was advancing this uh, theory and you know, trusting that we're all most of us here are, are law students. I think we're familiar with the theory of Dworkin, are people behind the original, people in the original position. So prior to having the state as is today, uh, what these people were deciding is, should I find myself in the most disadvantaged position in society? Would the law still sufficiently protect me? And that is, I think that is the essence of people saying that while the law might be what the majority say, it still aims to protect the minority. So again, just going back to that school of thought that um, people in the original position prior to having the society as is today, prior to the veil of ignorance being lifted, um, had a conversation where they were like, should I be the most disadvantaged person in society? What would be my place with the law? Yeah, so I think that would be my response to that point on democracy. And I'd hand over to you, Max, if I've answered what, um, you know, the questions. Uh, thank you, Chris. Elaborate on the democracy bit and even in the earlier bit of Eric Gitari. So, from, from that definition or from what majority of the panelists are saying, there's a, a need for a clear distinction between the LGB from the TI part of the alphabet of that community. And there's also something interesting that is coming from Quinta uh, just by the fact that there's TI or there's no TI in that name does not mean that they cannot champion for that cause. That's very important for this discussion because it formed part of the argument of the case. Other people felt like by the virtue of the group being LGBTQ and the rights that Terry Gitarre was fighting for the lesbians, bisexuals and gays, it was bringing in a conflict of identification between the two teams. So therefore brings me to the third question. Uh, wow, we have been joined by our second guest, Grace Maina just joined. Welcome, Omar. You're joining when we are having a, 
a discussion, we're just moving to our third question and I hope we'll bring you up to speed later. Our third question is this, from what majority of the panelists are saying, it is clear that the LGB fight for a different cause than the TR. And there is a general misconception, if you can call it, or a general that whatever the LGB is fighting for right now, whatever freedom they're looking for, is already accorded in the Bill of Rights. And therefore the concern should actually be put on the TI that's now falls there uh, you know, involuntarily. From what the panelists are saying, it's, it's almost assumable that it is voluntary to be, mem to be a member of the LGB group. And it is very involuntary to be a member of the TI. So that forms the basis of our third question. Are the LGB sorry, included championing for rights already protected for in the Bill of Rights? What are your thoughts? And while addressing that, then now we can address the third question that we were talking about. Should sexual orientation be a ground for non-protection of the law? Take that, Kirumburu, go first. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Now, I think, I think well, Mark, kindly sorry. Someone's, okay. So, uh, thank you very much. Now, first of all, I would first of all like to very much distance myself with my earlier sentiments on stating that this might have been a biological defect. Uh, I think we all need to learn a lot of inclusivity and a lot of uh, good language, you know. Uh, it's all a learning uh, moment. So um, now, uh, okay, now onto the question. I'd also like to distance myself with the fact that uh, that uh, we think that these people are, are in the LGB grouping, LGB, yeah, LGB, the LGB bit because of their personal choice and preference. I think not. I really think that this is something that is completely out of their control. Uh, the same way that there are people who are asexual and they do not feel any form of attraction. There are people uh, towards anyone, the people who are demisexual, who they need some form of triggering since attraction is very hormonal and very biological. And I don't think it is in anyone's control what really uh, I don't know why I have to say this, but it, I don't think it's in anyone control what really turns them on. So I think that we just need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to live with ourselves as we are and maybe accept and uh, find a way of mitigating if, if it really doesn't really suit you. Now, uh, the question that has been uh, uh, Sorry, the question that has been addressed has been asked is that these people are actually fighting for rights that they have. I think not. I don't think they are fighting for rights that they are. They have been protected under the constitution uh, fully. Uh, this is because, uh, in as much as the constitution is the wording of uh, the society, uh, you shall not discriminate. Article 37, you know, in as much as the constitution has all these provisions that uh, try to lie to us that they are protecting of everyone, the reality is that they actually are not, uh, because uh, society has actually uh, time and again discriminated over these people. Uh, it's not once or twice that we've had cases of uh, lesbians being correctively, I put that in quotes, you know, correctively being raped by even uh, their relatives, you know, and it's not once or twice that we've had cases of, you know, um, men are uh, going to report cases of violence against them. Uh, there's actually an Eric Guitar case uh, where he actually, uh, he, he went to report uh, uh, of violations uh, by his neighbors and uh, he was receiving violence, his house was being, uh, uh, you know, I think what's this, uh, he's, it's being painted, he's being called sugar everywhere, you know, and then you come to realize that uh, that is not the life any of a normal, you know, uh, someone who would say that, not like normal, like they're different, but like that's not the life that you enjoy, you enjoy a privilege and uh, the fact that they're actually championing these rights, I think it's a, it's it's not that they have all the protections that we enjoy. Uh, I think going into some of like 
seeking uh, recognition or marriage, uh, that might be a stretch. But I think at the most basic level, uh, they should be able to be protected from discrimination. And, you know, there's, what does, uh, I have forgotten the exact, yeah, it's still Article 27. At the end of it all, where the, states, the, the state is to undertake uh, I think mitigating factors or, you know, uh, it should undertake steps to actually mitigate uh, the same reason why we have affirmative action for women. That's that's what I'm trying to, to say before I, I, instead of trying to trace the constitution right now, but like the, the state should take such actions. I think it's very important that uh, even for these people, in as much as the state uh, doesn't, is not taking any actions, it should try. And then now finally, as I, as I conclude, uh, there's uh, the 162, 163, and 165, uh, which uh, the penal code, uh, which uh, we had stated most of, mostly will not address it. But the very fact that it exists as part of our penal code as trying to legislate over bedroom affairs, you know, and it has not really given a definition of a natural act, you know, then uh, some of these actions or relations that even people have uh, within their bedrooms, even if they are not, uh, say, homosexual, you know, uh, even if it's, you know, a married couple and they they engage in, say, anal sex, you know, according to the penal code, that's also wrong. And also according to, I, I don't really remember, I think it's also the case, the repeal 162 case, uh, the 2019, the 2019 case with the Guitar National Gay Lesbian Human Rights Commission case, that same case also uh, has also, uh, they tried to define uh, the, the scope of section 162, 163 and 165. And then you get to realize that, uh, really uh you do not you are not in the same state as these people the constitution does not try to uh, fully protect them and you cannot try to lie to yourself that they are you know their their battle is really not uh really not justified i really think it's justified i just think the fact that our society is very emotive and tries to pretend a lot in the fact that we are trying to hoodwink her and hide and pretend that uh, we are, you know, we're a happy society. None of these things exist. And if they do, they're just right under the closet. But the reality is, you know, uh, the fact that uh, they happen, uh, we need to talk about it and we need to find uh, even our lawmakers to find uh, a way of trying to uh, make the Article 27 the truth of society, you know, trying to make uh, equality, human dignity, the reality of society. I think that's what my take would be on that. Uh, thank you, thank you, Kiru, for for that for that uh, elaborative one as well. So Kiru is of the idea that no, okay, these people are the same like other humans, and they go through issues that are hurtful than what other humans go through. So the misconception of the notion that uh, the LGB group are fighting for rights already accorded under the Bill of Rights is mistaken. However, it's a general thought, and people feel like, if you see the arguments that these people are advancing, or the members of the LGB community are advancing, is that they are harassed by state officials, they are subjected to physical violence, their death threats, the stigma that results to that particular discrimination, is physical and sexual assault and so and on. But you see, uh, people believe and other people believe, a large population believes that these are issues that also face the large population that are not members of the LGB. And the law is very clear that when anyone is faced with issues, then they have a method of redress, you see, of following the law, you know, of going to sue and, and, and such and such. So, uh, the reason why we started with the first ambit of the conversation of whether the LGB and the TI uh, forms the same group, and you guys, the panelists of the idea that they don't, was to form a foundation for this conversation. If we say that the LGB uh, community, for example, uh, do not have any defect, and so reduce the word defect, and so therefore there is just an issue of attraction. And then these people go ahead to say that they're being physically harassed and so on and so on, and now they need a special protection of the law is indeed justifiable for sexual orientation or for some as for someone's sexual orientation to put them outside the protection of law. Because if you are championing for this 
same things that are affecting the very same community and you want to be so loud or at it enough or be louder at it than even the members of the general community. And then there are statutes that put you at a particular spectrum, you know, as a legal person, and that's also a wrong term to use, though this is a free space of discussion. Should that law therefore be, be upheld so that you don't bother us with the nonsense of how you feel? You see, you don't bother us, there's a law and we don't uphold that. Or should now the law say, you see now you are a special human than us and you feel like a group. Now we need to hear you if you are a minority group. So because Quinta said that her time might run out around 8.30 and our second race has just joined us, I'd like to first hear Quinta on the same on whether AGB are fighting for rights already in the Bill of Rights, and whether the state is justified for, for putting certain sexual orientation outside the protection of law. And then we'll bring in Grace on the same. Quinta. Um, um, am I audible? And your video is on. Um, so I hope I'm audible. Uh, but yes, those rights are really provided for. OK, yep. Um, you can hear me, right? Okay, so I trust I'm audible. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that those rights are really in the Bill of Rights. The rights that um, the LGBTQI are, you know, asking for are really in the Bill of Rights. If you look at the AG petition uh, that had challenged the constitutionality of 165, 162 of the Penal Code, um, it's with reference to the rights already provided for in the constitution. It's with reference to um, the right of equality before the law and equal protection of the law. It's with reference to the right to privacy. It's with reference to the right of the freedom and security of the person, with reference to the right of uh, the right to dignity. So these rights are already provided for in the constitution. And it's imperative to note that um, these human rights are inherent. They are not granted to you by the state. So those rights are there, they're recognized in the constitution and they're applicable to everyone. However, we must recognize that the state enjoys a certain power. What uh, the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights terms as the margin, um, is it the margin of, uh, you know, I have forgotten the precise name, but the state enjoys a certain power to limit these rights. Now that's what we must recognize. So number one, it's important to note that the rights are provided for in the constitution. Yeah, the rights, uh, even, and even though the reading of article 45.2 vis-a-vis the reading of article 28 or, in, or article 27 on non-discrimination might bring some sort of, um, you know, uh, discussion due to the lack of uniformity there, the constitution does provide rights. However, the state enjoys a certain uh, margin of discretion in this limitation, in limiting these rights. And that is what is happening to the LGBTQ uh, community. Because um, by virtue of the provisions of Article 45, sub Article 2, by virtue of the provisions of Sections 165 and 162 of the Penal Code, the, constitu uh, the state has effectively limited the rights of certain people to freely enjoy expressing sexual intimacy with their partners. How enforceable the said provisions are is subject to debate. Yeah, how enforceable the said provisions are vis-a-vis -vis the standards provided set by the constitution is subject to debate. However, this is a clear, um, it's a clear demonstration of a situation where the state has used its powers as exercise its margin of discretion um, and just you know, opted to limit certain rights as a result of taking into account the historical and cultural context of the society. So if you look at the EG petition, uh, the court looked at various uh, jurisprudence from various national courts and even regional courts in other jurisdictions. And so instances where courts had indeed uh, ruled certain provisions to be unconstitutional for violating or rather for discriminating against different people because of their sexual orientation. The court also noted and took into account our 
the context because you don't just interpret the constitution by reading the words of the constitution. The constitution is a live document. You have to breathe life into it and you cannot just ap adopt a very rigid textual approach to things when you're dealing with the constitution. And so the court sought to examine our historical background. Yeah? During the drafting of the 2010 constitution, the debate on um, you know, sexual minorities came up. And yet, somehow Article 45.2, despite the provisions of Article 27, ended up in the constitution. Why? Because it, it's reflective of a society that is yet to, or rather a majority of the society is yet to embrace that. Yeah. So while truthfully, no, nothing prohibits anyone from being gay. And it would be very wrong of us to even assume that the constitution, the penal code, nothing, nothing prohibits anyone from gay, being gay. However, the society as is today and the provisions of 162 and 165 demonstrate a situation where while you can have, and I, you know, you can say that this is your sexual orientation, how you express it, whether or not you can get married to your partner as a result of this mutual sexual attraction you have is limited. So you're not prohibited from being gay. You can be gay and never have sex. And really no one will be bothered because it's not against the law to be gay. Neither is it against the law to be a lesbian. And neither is it against the law to be bisexual. So no one will stop you. No one will arrest you for that. However, when it comes to an expression of certain activities, sexual activities between same-sex persons or what the penal court deems as unnatural and against the order of nature, then that is where now the debate comes in. But uh, these rights that the LGBTQ community are fighting for, they're already embodied in the constitution. It is just that the society as is today hasn't accorded them that space, which is why in, in the EG petition, um, some of the petitioners were citing that, you know, they were even scared of going to hospital because of the kind of treatments they'd received uh, because as a result of being MSMs, you know, uh, that they were scared, uh, their families disowned them because society, a, a majority of the society, and sadly to say, is yet to embrace the fact that there are certain people who are different. So while these rights are there, what uh, the LGBTQ community is doing is trying to um, you know, seek from the state additional protection. So the same way, and no, not to put the two things on the same level, uh, because that would be again be very very debatable but just as the state has protected other minority groups what the lgbt community is basically asking from the state is fine you've given you've said those rights are there then why don't you modify your legislations why don't you align society in a way that we are we also feel protected because uh, you can't just say the right is there if i don't feel protected as a result of that right so that should be my take and i think with that i'd be dropping off in the next few minutes thank you uh, thank you thank you so much queen and i wish you stayed to hear uh, grace also on the same in the field before you leave i know it 45 is not there yet but thank you so much for today for showing up and having this session with us before a second guest came in we have learned a lot from you and it's also awesome catching up after the judging days that for you was quinta utieno um, a friend of mine she's a graduate from Kenyatta university school of law and currently working with center it was a worthy engagement. Now, however, we are still on this question, and now we are welcoming our mother in mood. We hosted her briefly last week, and uh, she promised she'd be back fully for an engagement. Oh. And I can't wait to hear what Grace oh. has for us today. However, on the same, so the question of whether the LGB are fighting for rights in the Constitution. Dorothy Ruto, please mute your microphone. Dorothy Ruto. <laughs> Dorothy Ruto, please kindly mute your microphone, Miss Dorothy Ruto. Thank you. So the, the argument that the LGB and the LGB are fighting for rights already accorded in the Constitution. Article 20 of the Constitution says that the, the judges and the courts should adopt, adopt an interpretation that most favors the enforcement of a right and a fundamental freedom. There's a question that Moses Oguto has posed or uh, an, an assertion that he has posed at the, uh, at, at the platform, the chat platform, that these individuals are marginalized and therefore there's need for a, a affirmative action 
as for marginalized groups. As you bring in um, Ms. Maina on the same, whether LGB are fighting for rights already accorded in the constitution and whether the protection, I mean, the, the stipulation of uh, section 162, 163 and 165 of the penal code that puts them outside the protection of law by virtue of their sexual orientation is justified. I want us just to understand what is the concept first. Are the LGB, the people of their own sexual orientation, who are choose to have sexual attraction to people of the same gender, qualify to be members of the LG, I mean members of the marginalized group as per the articles 55, 56, and 260, the interpretation article of the constitution? And if they qualify to be people of the marginalized group, are they fighting for rights already accorded to them the Bill of Rights? Or is it justified by putting their protection outside the protection of law by the virtue of their sexual orientation? Grace. Uh, thank you so much um, for having me, Mr. Okola. Uh, happy to be back again. And you've asked a very extensive question. I was actually trying to take notes, but I'll respond uh, to as many as I can. I know you have been saying that we need to join using um, our, 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 with our video on. So if you could just give me a second to switch to a device as I continue answering the question, you will possibly be able to see me soon. But just to look at this question and from where I picked up on the arguments, the biggest uh, issue so far is that one are the two distinct groups, um, be it the LGB and the TQI, um, are they one and the same thing, which I think you've properly addressed. And aside from that, the question of, should we then um, accord them rights? And as we accord them rights, how do we ensure sure. that they're protected? So uh, I apologize, my video quality is not the best, but I'm just trying to follow your rules. So the first yeah, thing, uh, yes. So the first thing I want, I'd, I'd, I'd want to start by stating is there is what you learn that just because that uh, justice is done, it, it needs not just to be done, but it needs to also appear to be done. That's the biggest thing that I have with this case. Uh, you had previously stated that the case that I just would be looking at is an arbitrary case. And it's very important to note that in that case one, the first issue that the court stated, even after the submissions of all the parties, was that it's not a moral question, it's a question of the freedom of association as guaranteed in the constitution. Now, the problem in this particular case is all the arguments ended up being very, for lack of a better word, quite emotional, quite um, based on the, by dint of religion and the same. But we know one thing about justice, justice is a blind sword that strikes. And the whole concept of justice being blind is that it is available to all. And because it is available to all, justice does not wait for a society to be ready to guarantee that society the rights that is due to its people. The social contract theory basically says that when you donate power to the organ of the government, you expect as a member of that society to be seen to be visible. Now, I understand what some speakers um, who spoke before when they said, and they said that in the end, um, the society is not ready to accept this phenomena. And it also echoes the sentiment of the president who previously said that this is an issue in our society. However, we cannot wait until there's nothing to be done. And even as I try to answer your question, uh, the LGB and the TQI, there's two very um, distinct issues. There's a the fact that one group of people are, um, and if I can even just look for the terminology used in the case, because I like being bound to what I was, um, I was asked to come and speak on. The case is very clear that when it comes to the LGB, uh, when I get that paragraph, I'll talk about it. But when it comes to the LGBT, LGB, it only covers um, not an emotional state, I will disagree with that, but it covers issues of one, a physicality, and secondly, um, when it comes to the transgender, I believe it's actually paragraph 38 of the case. The distinct difference between 
the LGB and the TI um, is that being bisexual is a feature of a person um, who a person is attracted to and a person of the same sex or of both sex, sexes, whereas being a transgender and intersex person is a feature of a person's own identification with a particular sex. I had not heard if this had come up from any one of the previous speakers. It's really a question of not just emotion, but in terms of the form of attraction. The problem comes in when you're telling people you can be attracted to this person, but you can only be attracted to this extent. But even when it comes to the TI, it becomes an issue of, now I am not, it's not even a question of attraction. It's because someone will look at me and maybe see that my hormones are more dominant in this feature and make a decision and determine that this is how I will be born. In the end, I do not have a decision on how society perceives me. So what happens when indeed I was not supposed to go with this particular gender? Or what happens when I am both? Does the law foresee such a situation? And though um, it has been argued that the, that the constitution is a, is a document that um, we should also interpret the spirit of it, it's also very important to recognize some of the issues that came up during the BBI judgment. And one of the cornerstones of the argument was if the constitution is clear and speaks directly in, in, in express terms of what it states, then we really have no business trying to interpret it further than what it already says. If the constitution says that there shall be freedom of association for every person, and that freedom of association is guaranteed, unless we want to delve as, as it happened in this, call, um, in this case and try to define who every person is, then really we're speaking for the constitution when the constitution is already clear. It has already been argued by, I mean, jurists all through that the constitution of Kenya is very ambitious. And one of the issues was, are we ready to accept the constitution in the shapes and the form that it comes? Because this constitution in no way limits rights of persons who you do not like. You do not apply the constitution because you feel that the, the, the people are ready to apply it. You do not apply the constitution because you feel this is what is right and fitting to do so. That's why we have a lot of problems even under Article 43, because we want social economic rights to be achieved, but we are here and we are told, no, the government is not ready, the concept of progressive realization. Because the constitution is not there to facilitate a comfortable enforcement of rights. It's there to guarantee the rights of all. So just because the constitution says that rights are there and are protected as has been argued here, it is not enough for a reading of the constitution to see that those rights are there. It is actually also important to ensure that indeed, when these rights are available, when these rights are protected, it is that justice be done, that it is a blind sword that cuts across all. So I think um, to that end, I have tried to touch on some of the issues that I had you talking about. And um, in case there is any question I've not answered, you can let me know but um, I would be happy to yield back to you, Mr. Ogola. And now that you've already seen me and my light is not the best, I can switch off my video. Thank you. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, all right, madam, there, there's no problem. You can switch on your video. I, I think from, from a legal view, uh, Ms. Maina has tried to capture our conversation very nicely. And just some of the things that you captured, or maybe we captured before you got in here, but it's still very beautiful um, getting from you. So um, right now, this is there, it's, it's past 8.30. So mostly this is the time we leave room for the audience. You know, we engage with you, we learn from you, you ask questions to our panelists, and also we engage with them. So before we generally leave it to the audience, there's a question I want the audience to grapple with so that we learn. And you, you can also leave your questions for Maina and Quinta on the chat box so that we can follow up before we close the answer to those questions. The question that I am shooting to the audience is, is sex and gender a same thing? This, this conversation took us almost two hours, two hours um, when we were having it with a senior lecturer and a few of you in this platform. Yes, there's the definition in the English dictionary. And yes, there's the definition in application of law. But what are your thoughts? Can gender be separated from sex? Or is it justifiable to say that sex and gender are not similar things? 
anyone from the audience, you can raise your hand or you can take the platform before Moses Ogutu comes in. Let me, let me, let me start with uh, this lady. Pardon me if you're not a lady. There is a person joining us and he's called Anhem. He was talking about uh, my question on Article 27 of the Constitution of Kenya. So as the first active audience, maybe you can take the floor with that question. Is sex and gender the same thing? If no, where then do you draw the difference? Anhem. Okay, uh, Anhem, I mean, is not responding. Eda Ayuma. Eda. Miss Eda. Okay, Miss Rosemary Wanjiru. Hi, Max. Yeah, uh, hi. So, we've missed you. In my opinion, huh? uh, she's more beautiful on the inside. She's the best. Joy, please mute for me this Tabitha Okeno from Christ because we can't hear the Rosemary clearly. Yes, Rosemary. So, in my opinion, there is a difference uh, when you're talking about sex and gender. Sex means um, the biological identification of a person, whether you're male or or your female, yeah. Uh, then gender means how you identify yourself, your internal self, what is in your mind. That is what you refer to gender. So you might, your sex might be male, but how you identify yourself to people is like a woman, or how you express yourself, or or or, or how you dress. So there is a difference between sex and gender and that also brings me to talk about um sexual orientation and gender identity just like i have said gender identity mainly deals with what is in your mind what what you think what you feel that is what you refer to as gender identity sexual oriented orientation mainly deals with uh your reproductive organs, whether you're male or you're female, what you have, what you're born with. That's what you mean by sexual orientation. Yes. Ah, okay. So that's a very interesting concept that Miss Wanjiru is telling us over there. And I just want to see the level of reactions that elicits because look, look at this. You're saying that by gender, then how I dress, how I feel in my head becomes my gender. So maybe I could be Max Ugola the way I am. Then I wake up tomorrow feeling like, um, like dressing like a woman, God forbid. And so the following day when I dress like a woman, I become Max Ugola the female. Is, is, is that the kind of conversation? Because then there is, a, there is the difference between gender and sex. I just want it to come out clearly. So who agrees with the roads, Mary? And who disagrees with the first variant? So let me, okay. let, me, let me clarify something that you have just mentioned, that one day okay. you wake up feeling like, uh, okay, you are Max Ogola, and uh, yes, one day you wake up dressing like a female, or one day you uh, wake up feeling like you want to dress like a male. So that's why we yes. have a category of people who identify as gender neutral. They don't categorize themselves themselves as either male or female. Okay, okay, Ms. Wanjiro, I'm bringing you in. But let's 
let us have this discussion and with all of you, you can chip in and help here. Uh, there's, yes, there's the general knowledge that sex is the, uh, the innate nature of being male or female, you know, due to the organs and the genitalia and the endorsements and so on. And that gender leans on the other side of expectations, the social, cultural and um, economic expectations that the society put on people. So it is these expectations that streamline along the sex lines so that gender and sex in certain instances become identical. A woman will be known by breastfeeding or things that women do. A man will be known by masculine things or what they do. So then hence forms the gender. But in that, in that conversation also there's a niche. The niche is this. When like, for example, in the Maasai community where women, for example, perform certain duties of men in other communities like building houses, does that now qualify those women to become male gender? Do they now cease from becoming female gender to male gender because their expectation or gender roles have changed? This is the conversation I want us to have. So uh, before Ms. Wanjiro comes in, Ruben, Kiru, Kiru. Okay, before Kiru, okay, let's okay. just go Sorry. back to Santos because she's raising her hand. So, Kiru. Okay. Yeah. Proceed on the okay. difference between gender and sex, if there's any. Okay, yeah. Now, I think uh, there's a very, very big difference between gender and sex. And uh, of course, because uh, most of us are. Uh, ignore the fact that uh, that gender is what's the word a social construct exactly gender is a social construct but then uh, sex is sex is biological and gender is a social construct the society has already made us uh, think of uh, gender as uh gender and sex to be the same thing it's very very distinct and it, it's very important that one one oh sorry i feel like na jung in a reverberate that we distinguish between the two because uh the moment that we 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 bring about the we try to make gender and sex seem like the same thing uh people tend to confuse themselves uh especially um sorry there, there was something that okay, okay. distracted me. sorry now usually we can, uh, can you can you hear me yeah can you hear me yes yes uh okay good so now uh sex and gender are very different sex is biological gender is a social construct when coming to uh, the sexual minorities and the gender identity groups most people have an issue with trying to uh, distinguish uh, to to group them because they try to state to, they try to make it seem as if all of it is just uh, all of it is just a uh, uh, a sex issue or a gender issue, which is very different. And the example you're giving with the Maasai, with the Maasai communities, those are gender roles and not sex roles. So now uh, what the LGBTQI people have issues with mostly, the transgender people have issues with their gender. They are born uh, with the societal expectations that men uh, will act in a manly way. They will, you know, they will be the leaders and the heads of the homes. They will go to work. They're expected to be, when they're angry, to be violent. They're expected to be, when, to be the ones who are commanding and the women to be the more feminine feminine uh, gender. Uh, actually, there's even synonyms, men being called the more masculine gender and fem women being called the more feminine gender. Uh, now, uh, I, I tend to think that uh, gender is something that can be abolished with. Uh, it's not really necessary because uh, in the society or the society of the future or the society that we're actually heading towards, not now, uh, maybe a hundred years to come, I think gender will not really be that big of a deal because uh, of the steps that women empowerment feminism have undertaken to 
try mitigate and bring about those differences. Now, sex on the other hand, uh, especially now this one affects the intersex uh, people mostly, uh, is whereby uh, people are, are born with uh, one or two uh, distinctions that makes them uh, indeterminate you know their sex is more or less indeterminate they may be a, a, a boy on the outside but then uh, they have ovaries on the inside because you know some of our some of our sexuality sex, some of the, the especially the, the female uh, reproductive system some of the organs are internal such as the uterus you can't really see them uh, so like they may have one of those uh, bit, one of those differences hence making them intersex and then now for intersex people I think there's there's also a very big challenge for them and their sexuality because now if someone is intersex you wouldn't even know uh, what sexual orientation what is the gender of societal expectation is it how they look like or is it uh, the more dominant or the least dominant is it the, the ovary that also produces hormones or is it uh, the you know what will really really be the the, the, the biggest issue and also uh with a lot of intersex people, especially in the country, there comes along with issues of corrective surgery. Sometimes there's also call, there's also infant, infanticide because uh, people don't want to live with the shame and trauma of something of that sort. Uh, an example of a famous uh, intersex person is Audrey Uh There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, cases on Andrew uh, Her name was actually Andrew. She went to Kiambu High School and then post adolescence she started growing breasts. And then she realized, um, well, I really wasn't really born uh, a, 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 a man, but I was born intersex. And the feminine features started uh, uh, bringing about, started, uh, what's it called again, appearing. No, with the gender gender roles, because uh, they're not sex roles, because, you know, like, I think everyone, everyone should learn to cook because it's a basic important thing. But now, like, our society has really made uh, gender roles to be very, very shouting because our society is very uh, gender oriented, uh, not just our society, the Bible, there's so many, like, it's, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of, Oh, not just the Kenyan society, but like almost all societies have brought about uh, the aspect of of gender and the gender roles and the gender uh, issues. Uh, I think uh, I think that uh, basically uh, addresses uh, the between the distinctions between gender and gender and sex. Uh, its relevance to the topic and uh, yeah. And basically, the aspect of gender roles and whether they can be switched, especially since our society is moving to a direction where gender roles are swiftly shifting. Okay, thank you, Mburu. That was that was an elaborative one as well. It took to good time. I hope we understood. Though we 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 are not finishing that discussion there. I think my Miss Glynis Maina will finish it. We'll finish it at last. But before we bring Miss Glynis in, there are two people I want to bring in within the eight minutes remaining. There is a guy in the chat box called Gachewa. Pardon me if you're not a guy because I assume pronouns. Gachewa says that um, sex is either male or, uh, no, that is more answering to Gachewa. Sex and gender are one and inseparable. And there are three genders, but really two. Gachewa, could we hear you vocally before we bring in Moses Ogutu and close with Ms. Maina? on your thoughts that gender and sex are the same because apparently you're the only person feeling so. Uh, hello. Maybe with me, yeah? Yes, proceed, bro. Uh, thank you for giving me this chance. So I feel that sex and gender are one and the same because when it comes to gender, okay, people say that gender is more of a social construct and uh, it's more of artificial while sex is biological and natural. But I think that what sex and the relationship between sex and gender is what we need to be looking at. Sex is all is there to facilitate gender and to guide it. So the organs you have, the biological you, the biological sex, whether you are male or whether you're female, you know, it comes with the organs and then the there's hormones, there's brain wiring and all that stuff, which is biological, which guides you to be more of this gender and more of 
maybe less of this other gender. So that's why you find that traditionally and over a very long time of uh, human history, there has been gender roles and uh, which have been like very concrete. You know, there have been fathers and fathers have, their work has been to do this. There are mothers and then their work has been to do this, to, to, to bear children, to, uh, to care for them and stuff like that. And it has worked over uh, millennia. Right now is, is only when we are trying to change these things because we think that these things are social constructs and they can be abolished. <clears throat> but I don't think that's, that's right. I think sex is there to facilitate gender and you can't, you, can't, you can't undo that or try to change that without having consequences on the society. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you, Ms. Kachewa. Okay, an insightful thought. Insightful thought I might have maybe thought alongside your line, but there's a reply you're getting from Smog. So if you could hear Smog also vocally before I bring in Moses. Smog, you have a minute to answer Kachewa or maybe just air with us your thoughts on the same. I, I think my predecessor I've tackled the issue very well. I, I don't have any else. To yes. add. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Smog. Uh, he's a he's a brief guy. <laughs> yeah. So there's a form that has been sent to you guys in the chat box by Ted. Uh, Ted is my friend. Is the guy handling our tech. So we just need to know the feedback what your thoughts are, kindly just click on the form as we finish, kindly fill it so that we have a feedback from you guys. We know one, two, now to improve and one, two on where we've done better. If you're still in session, kindly don't chat without filling that form. Uh, within the five minutes remaining, I'm going to call in my friend, Musa Sugutu uh, from the Kenya School of Law, maybe on the same concept, and then we'll invite our second guest to finalize on the question, and then I'll close until next week. Moses, maybe just to share with us one, two from today's discussion as you answer the question. Um, okay, uh, thank you, Max. Uh, thank you all. And if I may give a shout out, uh, hi, Grace. It's been long. It's good to see you here. Um, on the topic that we've discussed today, I think it's very insightful. And I think it speaks to the zeitgeist of where we are as a nation and also where the world is moving. Together with that, uh, it's good that we pointed out or we've gotten to understand the issues of LGB to fall under sexual orientation, TI to fall under gender identity. And to the question at hand about sex and gender, sex is what you are saying at birth based on your biological a social construct because a particular sex has always been informed to be performing certain roles in the society. And that's why we call them gender roles. And yeah, so far, let's keep planning on this and seeing on how the keeping that, I think the issue that why they are lumped together and sometimes which is not to be the case, it's just the issue of liberty. You know, we human beings are born, are brought to this world in order to be free to live our true selves being unapologetically you. And you get that because of certain constraints within law, within society, within morality, people tend to live in, for lack of a better term, in the shadows, not expressing who they truly are. And as Grace will step in, and as she had stated earlier, we cannot wait for the society to come and say okay now we are okay with this or whatever and in the same vein we are doing what we are denying justice to these other persons and if i may just leave you guys with one thing or when we talk about law and whatever let us remember that slavery once upon a time was legal whereby human beings were subjected to the lowest forms that you can subject a person with that, I'll close. I'll return the mic back to Max. Yeah, thank you all. And once again, hi, and I'm glad to be here. 
thank you so much, Moses. You being this platform also means a lot to me and to us. And it was a worthy engagement hearing from you, bro. Thank you. So in this moment, let's just shoot it back to our honorable guest, Grace, to close with our thoughts on sex and gender. I hope our statement should be the closing statements on that topic, and then we'll just close our session for today. Mom, take over. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kola. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kutu. Hi. Um, yes, it's nice to be here. Uh, again, I'm very grateful and I apologize for coming in slightly later than I had anticipated. But um, I'm very happy that I have gotten the discussion that, as at where it is. So the question is whether um, sex <laughs> and gender are one and the same thing or not. So I will start with agreeing with some of the sentiments of Mr. Kashawa. And to be very honest, if you look at the interpretation of some of our laws, sex and gender have been used interchangeably. And it is easy to say that they are different because really there could be a glaring difference with the fact that a person is male and female. And then going on to say that by, by dint of their gender as being male or female, there are constructed roles, behaviors, and identities which I do not have a problem with, but I think Mr. Gashawe did raise, and I, I hope I'm saying the name correctly, did raise a very important thing that we should not ignore in this discussion. And he stated that gender does indeed flow from sex. And in the context of the LGBTQ community, and also in the context of the Eric Kitari case, uh, you cannot ignore the fact that this was a big question with regard to the interpretation of Article 27, whether sex in that context meant sexual orientation. So I do believe that um, a rephrasing of this question would be, what then is the difference between sex and sexual orientation? But um, not to really down that road um, quite far, just to comment on this, um, the, the biggest issue that... Um, is before us today or did come up in the Eric Kitari case is not on whether um, someone subscribes to, I'm, I'm looking for a very um, mild way to put this. The, the question, when you look at the arguments raised by the parties in the Eric Kitari case and some of the very key issues raised by the petitioner, were that because of my sex, you cannot stop me, or because of how I choose to identify, you will not stop me from um, exercising my rights and my fundamental freedoms. So therefore, the question then will be, would sex satisfy, even as you distinguish it from what is socially acceptable, would sex then be a ground for you to say, okay, then this person can be granted a certain right or can have their rights limited under Article 24? And I just want to conclude on that and basically not keep you here for so long. One thing that um, someone spoke, I think Mr. Kiru, he spoke and he said that because of the feminism and the women's rights movement, then when it comes to issues of people being you know, openly gay or openly lesbian, there is a better approach to it. I would wish to be for that and say, so just feminist or women's movement, if anything, that's because it is a socially construed role for, for women to fight for the rights of others when ideally even men are fighting this, this, this battles. Eric Kitari was a gentleman. So it actually goes back to what an earlier speaker was saying, the need for affirmative action programs, not to facilitate um, just the marginalized communities in the constitution. No, as I said earlier, it is very important to remember that the constitution does not become enforceable when you are comfortable with its provisions. It is not there to cushion you uh, as an individual or as a superior individual who may have various benefits that other people don't have. It's not that to cushion you. But just to go back to Article 27 of the constitution, and please, if you will allow me, um, and some of the arguments that did come up in this case, it says that the state shall not discriminate directly or indirectly against any person on any ground, including race, sex, uh, pregnancy, marital status, health status, ethnic or social origin, color, age, disability, religion, conscious belief, culture, um, dress, language, or birth. A reading of that section 
will confuse you to some extent because it, it encompasses both elements of sex and both elements and also other elements that will be construed as gender. Because when you talk about issues such as cult, um, dress, um, then you would be saying that's not um, necessarily conforming to what other people may, be will, may willingly say is being male or female. Dressing is as per your social construct or what you've been exposed to. So I think the difference may be glaring as some of the speakers have correctly put so, but it is very important to also remember that they are joined at the hip in terms of the reading of the law. Sex, I mean, gender flows directly from the attribute of whether someone identifies as male or female. And that is where we have the problem we have today because as a society, we know that someone may either identify as male or they may identify as female. And when we do not have them identifying to what we socially think should be male and female and subsequently subscribe to the construed roles, then that is where the issue starts. Because again, you also have to remember there are four genders. There is what Mr. Kiru was saying, the attribute of being masculine and the attribute of being feminine, and the fact that you construe masculinity to the male and femininity to the female, but there is also the neuter and the common. And those four genders, we as people interpret them to be because you are masculine, you are male. And when we find a female who is masculine, you question, wait, are they female or not? So that's actually what I wish to just say on those two terms. And I wish to also maybe just urge you guys to go back and read that case because the biggest discussion revolved around the fact that the terminology sexual orientation, which now um, opens another Pandora's box, does not expressly appear in the constitution. And because it does not appear in the constitution, is it covered under Article 27? And just, uh, just, for you also to take another take home assignment, do you now interpret it under Article 160? Because uh, Article 27 is not closed ended, it's actually quite open ended. And sexual orientation is a person's identity in relation to the gender or gender, genders to which they're sexually attracted. The fact of being either heterosexual or homosexual. So that introduced two new terminologies, which I think are very essential for you to think about in this discussion. And when you look at that, you then go back to the debate that came up in the matter. Just because, uh, because sexual orientation is not specifically listed in the constitution, does that mean that you can discriminate because of now what somebody chooses, not the social contracts, I mean, con contrast or the social uh, conditioning that is there. When you make a decision on your identity and you decide that you are attracted, to this particular person does the constitution allow for you to be discriminated against. Uh, I apologize, I see I have taken uh, a bit more time than I anticipated, but those would be my concluding remarks. And I wouldn't even say they are concluding remarks per se, I would say it's it's more of a homework. Go and read the Kitari uh, case, um, see how those issues were tackled. Look at, you know, the I was waiting to hear you people quote, because when, when I taught you moot court, I taught you one thing and I told you, you never come to a battle like this without authorities. Unfortunately, I haven't had any one of you quote any authorities and there's so much wealth in the determination. And you can see that the panel of Lenaola, Mumbi and Odunga really belabored the point of the fact that you cannot apply the constitution to suit specific people and you cannot protect individuals who are liked. So I just urge you, even if you won't read the entire case, because maybe you feel that, oh, you know, you don't have the time, I would encourage you just take from paragraph 85 to paragraph 100 and, you know, 125 thereon, and then start on 127 and look at the issue of discrimination, then see how um, that would then feed into your argument of what is sex and what is gender. And further to that, what is sexual orientation and the effect of the same. Again, I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity. I'm very happy to see all the people who I trained once upon a time here. And I'm also very happy to see people whose names have appeared somewhere on my YouTube channel. I'm grateful and I hope you continue learning and being the best version of the lawyer that you can be at this point. Thank you.
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Maina, for the opportunity, for the lesson you've shared with us, and for all those insights you have given as a takeaway assignment. Uh, thank you for making time for being with us today. Also, a very big thank you to the panelists, all of you. Uh, Michelle Santos, Ayo Asembo, Lemayan Yenko, Wanjiro Gitirwa, Ruben Kiru. Thank you for our guest and also in absentia, um, Ms. Otieno Achien, Quinta from Centum. Thank you. It was a good session. Now, my big heartfelt thank you to all of you, uh, the members who took time to be with us in a discussion today to learn, to engage, either via text or even if you didn't engage, but you took your time to be with us through this entire session. Also, a big thank you. Uh, we are finishing just one minute to uh, 9 10 because we began at 7 10. So we are still so good within our two hour limit. But as you know, we change these cases, we do social and political in different. Uh, times. Last Wednesday, we discussed the appointment of 41 judges. Today, we are doing this Eric Gitari case. Next week, we'll be doing the obligation of the government to protect, which will be dealing with the Uruino case. And maybe we can revisit the Rafiki's Waruhu Kahiu case the following week. These cases are interesting. They're very um, informative and they're very instrumental in our learning, in our day-to-day -day application of the law. And so when you make time to be here with us, we learn from you and to learn from us. It goes a long way in our legal career. So thank you again and have a good night. May the Lord, may the good Lord protect you until next Wednesday. You can leave at will.